Alrighty, off we go. Welcome to Spinal Anatomy. It is not the summer. It is, last time I checked, it was the fall, which is good. I think the sooner we get done with this year, the better. Fall of 2020. Um, I built this class from scratch. Uh, the main chiropractic board book where most of the questions will come from are, is Kramer, third edition and Bogduke, who only covers the lumbar spine. Kramer goes, covers the entire spine. Uh, Standring is the big, thick Gray's Anatomy. Uh, Drake is the one you probably have. That's the student edition. And then I use some other sources as well. Uh, there's what the green Kramer looks like, and there's what Bogduke. This is a fantastic book. Kramer, um, I know him quite well. He is a fantastic guy. He's great anatomist. He is absolutely terrible clinically. Uh, Bogduk is the god of the lumbar spine. He's done more papers. Uh, he knows more about the lumbar spine than any human in the world, I believe. So that's a great book. You can actually get the paperback of Bogduk. The fourth edition is almost exactly the same. I think it's like 40 bucks. And you can study that even when you after you graduate, you can study that and study that, and you still uh, learn stuff from that book. That's a fantastic book. Uh, there, uh, there is Kramer, and there is me uh, at in Colorado at the National Board of Chiropractic Examiners. We're both on Spinal Anatomy and Neurology Test Writing Committee. And here we go. So, just in general, of course, this is the spine. Uh, there's a cervical spine with seven vertebrae, thoracic spine with 12 vertebrae, lumbar spine with five vertebrae. There's a sacrum, it depends how old you are. It, when you're a little kid, you have five sacral vertebrae, uh, but it, they fuse together by the time you're 20 into one block, usually. And then way down here is the little coccyx, and that's where we're going to start our uh, discussion. Uh, this stuff, I don't think I need to go over this again because we went over. I gave you a video you can watch on this, but um, so I think everybody's good because we did this in embryology. So uh, we'll actually do it in lab today. It should be really easy. Just remember the mnemonic chat, right? That's all the AKAs uh, for the axial plane. It's this green plane right here. So you can call that a cross-section, a horizontal, an axial, or a transverse. The ones we really use, I think, is horizontal uh, for anatomy. And then radiology, I use axial all the time. I think everything else you guys probably can figure out. So let's just get on with this. Um, everything I said already, 7, 12, 5, 5, and usually four segments, but it's very quite variable, the coccyx. Sometimes there's two, sometimes there's five, sometimes there's six. We're going to look at a crazy one where there's maybe, how about a hundred segments? Is that possible? Yes. No problem. Oh, it's not recording? Okay. Um, you know what, how about I just put it up on YouTube, is that good? Because if I stop this, it's going to mess everything up. So I will, somebody remind me to put the recording because I will forget. Um, let's see, yeah, because we're meeting tomorrow morning. I can get attendance tomorrow morning. All right, so we've been through all this. Let's keep moving on. And you guys interrupt me anytime you have a question, feel free to interrupt. Um, the spine also has some curves that are important. From an A to P view, the spine should be straight. And from a side view, from a sagittal view, we have some curves. Uh, like if this is, you can, my drawings are not like Dr. Doe's. That guy is an artist. My, here's my level of drawing. <laughs> that's the head. That's the nose. So the cervical curve is called a lordotic curve, and I'm exaggerating that crazy. And then the thoracic curve is kyphotic. The lumbar curve is lordotic again. And the sacrum 
is kyphotic in the and the coccyx is also a tiny ky kyphotic curve as well so those are imp always very important uh, th these curves are very important uh, when sco with regard to scoliosis you know when people from a to p view you know they have a crooked spine like if that's the back of somebody's head they may have a curve that looks like that and there's the sacrum down there so no research is showing that the this type of a s curve is not terribly important when it comes to pain it's the loss these people with scoliosis is usually have a flat and no thoracic or no lumbar lordosis or even a kyphosis and that the sagittal structure the sagittal having a, a proper sagittal sagittal curve is more important with regard to pain and it's more predictive of chronic pain um, than anything else so these this sagittal view having sagittal normal biomechanics is very important I don't know why I drew that because I could have uh, did it right here so we have a lordotic curve here thoracic kyphotic curve here lordotic then another kyphotic here pretty straightforward uh, normally the spine nobody's spine is straight perfectly straight like this in fact that would be a little weird because you have your heart right about here right the hearts about there and it actually pushes the thoracic curve a tiny bit to the right so that's actually maybe not quite that much but all right here's some standing films um, so oh that reminds me I forgot to put usually I make you guys learn learn watch the radiology lecture and I test you on radiology we should do that this quarter uh, so I will post a radiology video a lex YouTube lecture it's kind of a supplemental thing uh, and we'll we'll do a little radiology testing I, they usually do that in the lab portion of this class but the lab got pushed to second quarter so we might as well might as well uh, do it so you lo learn a little about radiology because uh, that's super important this person is actually all messed up does anybody actually see what's the matter with this person what's so structurally wrong with their spine because it's kind of a normal at least they have a lordotic curve here they have a little thoracic curve what about the cervical curve no cervical you are right the cervical should be c-shaped right uh, and it's not so that's not good probably in a car accident uh, anybody see see anything else this is a really tough one to see What's the matter with that? Oh, nice. You got it. If we blow that up, you can see if you if put dots at the back of the corners, they should always be in place. Right? And this corner is way back here. So L4 has slipped forward. And that is called a spondylolisthesis. It's probably an isthmic spondylolisthesis. There's five types of spondylolisthesis that you will get as you progress through this program. But most in younger people, they're usually isthmic. People over 55 or so, they're usually degenerative spondylos where the facets slip. You can also see our little friend, the coccyx, down here. Okay, good job on that. All right, let's get into the coccyx now. Uh, some people, lay people, call it the tailbone. Uh, it is triangular in shape, kind of looks like this from an A to P view, uh, with the base up in the air and the apex down here. That's always weird to me. You would think the when you say base, I always think, okay, the base sits on the ground. Uh, but that's not the case with the coccyx not the case with the sacrum and the patella is the same deal uh, the base is up in the air and the apex or the point is down toward the ground uh, so that's kind of weird it's usually made up of four coccygeal segments uh, these can be labeled either CO1 2 3 or 4 uh, or CX1 CX2 6 3 6 4 uh, take your pick the authors use these pretty much interchangeably um, definitely don't call it C3. Why wouldn't you call it C3? Dead 
That's right. That's your cervical. The C is reserved for the cervical spot. Good job. All right, and there is a, uh, that's an A to P view. That looks like actually there's the uh, cornea. This is a PA view, actually. Uh, but there it is. And you can see right off the bat, we got a weird one. Uh, it's only got three segments, uh, but each one of these is a segment. So this is CX or CO1. There's CO2 or CX1, whichever you prefer. And there's CX3. I like to call them CX. CO is like, I think, COO or something like that. Okay, um, so everything I said already, it's got an apex inferiorly and a base superiorly. So there, those of you who are a little shaky with those directional, medical, directional language. So inferiorly means down low. So the point of it, this is inferior, right? Up high, this would be superior. So superiorly, uh, that's where the base is. Inferiorly, that's where the apex is. Uh, and it's uh, usually slightly kyphotic in shape. And what good does it do? What does it do? It doesn't really do much of anything. Some authors like uh, Rothman and Simeone, uh, they believe they're very famous medical authors. They're also kind of like Bogue Duke. They're not quite as famous as Bogue Duke, but um, they believe it's fading out of existence as humans because it really doesn't do a heck of a lot. They thought it was a visual, They're, the thinking is it's a tail uh, from back in evolutionary days when we probably did have a, a tail if you're a believer in that stuff. I'm definitely a believer in that. Um, how do we prove that this was once a tail? There's a few cases. Well, look at this. Uh, this is a, let's look at this case. This is a two day old neonate uh, who was born with a 22 inch tail. So it's super, super rare, a congenital malformation. When they went in there operatively, uh, this connected right to the right to the coccyx. Um, so it had, I forget how many segments it had, like 40 segments or something. Um, but it was a real tail connected to the coccyx, which was connected to the sacrum. But does anybody see another problem? And we're going to talk a lot about these. We have a whole lecture on this problem. Because that little tail is the, the least of this little guy's worries. Does anybody see anything? <laughs> there is a big bump. <laughs> awesome, you got the big bump. Uh, so that's a spina bifida. Uh, that's a sp called a spina bifida manifesta. Spina bifida is we're going to look at a natural spina bifida a little bit in the lab that your bottom part of your sacrum every one of you has a natural spina bifida it's a hole in the in the vertebral arch and usually it's no big deal but sometimes it lets the spinal cord herniate out through the hole uh, and there's no lamina and sometimes there can be no skin even this one's at least got skin but the trouble the nerves that go to the legs are all tangled up and broken in here uh, and can you see evidence that the nerves are damaged on this picture. How about that? How's that butt muscle look? How's that gluteus maximus look? It looks very atrophied, right? The skin is all all bunched up, right? So there's not much of a muscle there. So the poor little guy is going to have a lot of trouble walking. So they're able to cut the tail off. And this is a British Journal of Neurosurgery is very, very high impact factor. It's a very reputable journal, uh, journal. so you can definitely believe that. Um, how does it develop? It has just one primary ossification center, so it turns into bone from one center. Vertebrae have three. We'll look at the dens, has five ossification centers when the time comes. Uh, this is just simple, it just has one ossification set, the center per segment. And uh, ossification is really all over the map. Uh, some people, 20 years old, it's still made out of cartilage. Uh, most people around 10, between 10 and 15, it turns into bone. A uh, little kids, it's cartilage, so it's not very breakable. But so it's kind of weird. The 
very variable ossification center. Uh, what does it do? It, it has no supportive function. Should have put it in our star. Remember that was on the last test. Uh, and people got it wrong. Uh, they said uh, the, the coccyx is important for supporting the spine. It gives axial load support to the spine. It supports axial load or something like that, I said. It doesn't do anything. It just hangs there. It doesn't attach to anything. Axial load is transmitted through the sacrums uh, into the coxal bones down the femur. So it doesn't do anything. It is, however, an attachment point for some muscles, which we'll see uh, in lab today. We'll see. take a look at some the cadaver section of it. Um, and uh, the gluteus maximus is basically on the dorsal part, connects to the anterior sides. Uh, levator ani is down at the tip, so you can kind of see that. It's kind of hard to see that on the cadaver. Uh, but coccygeus, you can definitely see. It's on the lateral portion on the ventral surface. Um, and let's take a look at those right now. So this is an A to P view. You can always tell A to P because you can see this little uh, this little pad right here. This is where it connects to the sacrum on this little pad. Um, but the the coccygeus muscle uh, would connect all in here, like this. Sometimes it connects all the way. Sometimes it, like on the cadaver specimen, I kind of connects on both sides all the way together. But you don't see coccygeus on the back side. If you flip it over to the back side, uh, this is all gluteus ma uh, maximus. Uh, just a little bit. The coccyx is really small. If you break your coccyx and it becomes a source of chronic pain and need to have it removed, uh, they just detach the gluteus maximus and this kind of uh, maybe atrophies a little bit, but it's not that big of a deal. The vader ani is on the very tip down here. Uh, live, and I'm sure some of you have heard of Kegel exercises, uh, right? Okay, that's your contracting levator ani. Um, like if you have diarrhea, here's a great example, a uh, great analogy. If you have diarrhea, you know how you squeeze your butt together to stop it from coming out? Kegel, that's like a similar to a Kegel exercise. Uh, that's levator ani at work there. Right here is an overhead view. The coccyx would be buried in all these muscles down here, uh, but you can see the the coccygeus muscle uh, would be right here, and then the rest is all levator ani. Levator ani has three parts to it, and so levator ani really just connects to the tip here, uh, and then it goes up and connects on the, this part of the sacrum, the anterior part of the sacrum as well. Not going to worry too much about levator ani. Uh, there's a normal, well, not a normal, it's a cadaver, but there's a nice thick gluteus maximus. You probably have looked at that in lab. I think that's the first, if I remember right. No, that's probably week two. You look at the post here, but you'll see gluteus maximus really soon. Hamstrings, biceps femoris. What connects the coccygeal segments? They, when you're little, you actually have a little disc. The in, the vertebrae in the thoracic spine, cervical spine, lumbar spine, they always have a disc, like a little kind of a tire between them. A little, we'll, we'll really get into the disc and, uh, when the time comes. But um, the coccygeal segments also start out with a little fibrous, fibrocartilaginous disc between them. Um, this thing, however, usually fuses together uh, by the third decade of life, so in the 20s, so your guys is probably well on their way to being completely fused. Same deal with a sacrum. It has discs and the, they fuse into transverse lines. Um, they actually have no name. You can see the little lines, but they it's an unnamed structure. When you get to the sacrum, they're called transverse lines or transverse ridges, but there's no name for them uh, other than just an ossified disc. And let's see, what else? Uh, occasionally it takes longer for the disc to ossify. Yep, in fact, sometimes C1 disc never ossifies, never fuses. So coccyx can be a little strange sometimes. Now let the biggest segment, um, and we do have one uh, sacrum that still has CX1. The first coccygeal segment is the largest. Uh, it has some important features that the other ones don't. It, it has an articular facet on its base. 
So an articular facet, uh, we're going to talk a lot about those. Your zygapotheciaal joints uh, have one. Your knees have articular facets. Your elbows, uh, your tibia, where it connects to the Taylor dome. There's articular facets everywhere. And they're just a kind of an extra protection that bone has. It's a fibrocartilage pad that is on top of bone and it connects. That's where two joints connect to. Uh, so there is one articular facet that actually connects not to bone, uh, but there's a real disc, kind of a thick disc that sits between the sacrum and the coccyx, and that's what it articulates with. There's also little transverse processes that kind of pro project outward from it, like little airplane's wings. And then there's these little horns that stick up uh, called coccygeal cornua. So let's take a look at from a P to A view. So we're looking at the back of CX1. And you can see these little airplane wings coming out and those are transverse processes. We have those in the lumbar vertebrae, the thoracic vertebrae, and the cervical vertebrae. So those are really common. They're pretty short and stubby here and they're much longer when we get into the the real spine. Uh, but the sacrum is the only place that really doesn't have them. Um, there's embryological remnants of transverse processes we'll look at. Uh, next week or maybe tomorrow because we have two hours tomorrow um, and then we see these little horns sticking up those are the coccygeal cornua uh, cornu I think it, I forget which one cornu I think is singular and cornua is plural not super I'm not like a big one with spelling um, which is not true in lab in gross one they're usually sticklers on spelling um, for me I don't worry about spelling you can always look it up. Uh, but coccygeal cornua meet cornua of the sacrum, which come down like this. And then there's a little intercornua ligament that connects these guys together like that. Oh, there's the base just of the coccyx. We can't see that articular pad from here, though. Um, we can see the C1 disc is right here, but it looks like it's petrified or ossified. We can see the C2 kind of ossified or disc here. Ossified meat's been turned into bone. Uh, this would be CX2. You get the deal. There's three, CX4. This one needs even got a little CX5 down here, it looks like. All right, uh, there's that articular facet we already talked about. And it connects uh, with a small disc that is between the sacrum and the coccyx. Now this is the A to P view, so we can see the articular facet uh, would be right in this region. Um, I still, even though the bones that we have are, you know, they're processed and the articular cartilage is basically gone for most of them, still when I, if I, if I have like number one right here, I'm looking for articular facet of CX1. Uh, so make sure because those facets are really, really important. We'll go over that more in lab. Um, there's the coccygeal cornua from this view, transverse process. Uh, looks like it does have a rudimentary disc here. There's a CX1 disc on this plane. CX2, 3, 4, and there's an extra segment, CX5 for this guy. Uh, we said this already, but this is a real uh, specimen where they... Actually, we have one like this. Right, I think I showed the people who've seen lab already. Uh, we do have one where this intercornual ligament that runs between the sacral corneal and the coccygeal corneal, uh, it's ossified together. And so that's ossified or turned to bone, ossified intercornual ligaments. And there is the disc. This disc looks like it's ossified as well. And let's see, what else do we need to say? these little horns here, what are they embryologically speaking? Uh, they're actually the articula, superior articular processes. And that'll make more sense tomorrow when we start. Or when we start talking about the lumbar spine, that'll make uh, probably more sense. Uh, but there's our superior and inferior articular processes give rise to the, the zygopotheciaal joints that us chiropractors adjust. Okay, it's connected by that intercornual ligament, as we said already, and this sometimes it ossifies. And you have to be careful if you're 
Uh, I never adjusted the coccyx. I just don't believe that area is. I leave that to the proctologist. Uh, but some chiropractors adjust the coccyx. But you got to be really careful because how do you know if it's not turned into ossify? If this thing is turned into bone and you adjust it, you could you could break it. You could literally break the coccyx loose and make things worse. So it's pretty hard unless you have an MRI to tell whether it's ossified or whether it's still movable. And let's see, uh, rudimentary transverse processes we looked at already. Uh, these transverse processes are important, clinically important, because they typically make up the S5 sacral foramen. And uh, these foramen are holes, of course, foramen are holes that nerves come out of. Uh, and the anterior and posterior rami, the sacral rami, actually come out of the sacral foramen usually. Sometimes you can get, well, I'm, I'll wait till we get to the picture here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's what I was going to show you. So let's go here. Um, so here's the coccyx, a P to A view. Uh, and there is, so these ligaments are always easy to name. So we know this is the sacrum. They're running from the sacrum to the coccyx. So they're all called sacral coccygeal ligaments. Uh, this one is lateral, right? Here's the midline. So it's lateral to the midline. So this, the one we're talking about, is called a lateral sacral coccygeal ligament. And you can see it makes a makeshift hole right here. Uh, there's real holes. There's the anterior and posterior sacral foramen uh, here where nerves come out of, and we'll look at that when the time comes. But there's, strangely, uh, this fifth coccygeal segment is a little bit weird. Not only does it not have a hole like this, it doesn't have a roof over the canal where the fecal sac is. Um, there's a hole here. This is actually a natural spina bifida that humans have. In fact, most of the time, it, the hole goes up this high. It's usually a two-level hole. This is a one-level hole. Um, uh, so we have an open space right there. Uh, but the, that, the key of this slide is the lateral sacral coccygeal ligament makes up the S5 sacral foramen. Okay, so there, the trick would be because all these other ones, they're called sacral foramen. There's an anterior and posterior sacral foramen. There is no true sacral foramen at S5. It's always made by either this lateral sacral coccygeal ligament. Sometimes what happens, what I was going to draw, sometimes you get an anomaly where this transverse process actually grows into the sacrum. And then you get a real bony hole here. Uh, but it's still not a normal sacral foramen. Okay, here's just another picture. There's our little uh, facet there. And what else? Rudimentary transverse process. I don't think we need to kind of cover that. We already talked about that sacral coccygeal disc already. It's made of fibrocartilage. And uh, it's kind of like the symphys pubis or pubis uh, symphysis joint. Uh, it's a what type of joint is it? it is a symphysis joint it's very strong uh, not much movement here normally that's why I never understood why do they want to adjust the coccyx when this thing doesn't probably not much normal motion here anyway especially if it ossifies um, although so we're still talking about that joint it's usually a symphysis type joint it's not always sometimes it's a real diarthrodial joint uh, so in some patients it's a real disc here like a meaty soft disc and it has a capsule around it and it's a real diarthrodial joint even the most of the time it's like the symphysis or pubic symphysis and then in other times even usually in older individuals it completely fuses into bone uh, so you got to be careful when you mess around with the coccyx if you're going to do that um, it can be malpositioned anteriorly, either fractured, uh, or this is where the chiropractic thing comes in, if, especially in younger kids. Uh, it could be, if it's a diarthroidal type joint, it could be dislocated forward or fractured forward, but you have to be really careful because it can grow forward as well and be completely normal. And I took some of these slides out because it was getting too long, 
Um, but let's take a look at this. So here's a sacrum. Right? It's a little malformed to begin with because it should have a little bit of a kyphosis to it. Uh, but nevertheless, there it is. And you can see this person fell on their butt. Oh, I oh, maybe I shouldn't tell you that. But you can you can see because I think I have a cool little test coming up here. See that there's a fracture line right there. That's fractured. Uh, but this is a patient of mine, Gina. I always remember Gina. Um, she had a herniated disc. Uh, but look at her coccyx. And I asked Gina. I said, "Do you've had?" pain down there before right have you ever had pain you ever fall on your butt no I don't have any problems there she just had back pain and radiating leg pain her coccyx was fine yet it's grown straight forward um, so you wouldn't want to grab there and bend it back because there's no reason to do that if she doesn't have pain there and that was a case 43 year old came in with coccygeal pain uh, from a slip and fall on cement and they had severe pain on palpation down there. You ordered a CT. And what do you think? I kind of spoiled it, didn't I? But you can see there is a fracture line. And so that is a fractured coccyx. All right, ligaments. Back to the ligaments we go. Uh, we looked at the lateral sacrococcygeal ligaments. We looked at the inter cornua ligaments but there's a couple more we need to talk about there's an anterior aka ventral sacrococcygeal ligament um, really not terribly exciting I uh, couldn't even find a picture of it uh, it is just a continuation of the anterior longitudinal ligament and it just runs between the anterior part of the sacrum and the end yes Go ahead. I can't see the chat. Yep, good question. Uh, because structures can refer, some people refer pain, like heart attack down the left arm. But in this case, it was straightforward because the, EM, the EMG NCV study was positive for radiculopathy, and she had a skinny calf, uh, which is from a, a compressed S1 nerve root. So coccyx couldn't possibly refer pain and cause those positive neurological symptoms. But good. It's usually if there's something wrong with the coccyx, it'll be the coccyx. They can't sit. They have to sit on a donut, like a little piece of foam with a hole cut out in the middle. They usually have pain right down there and it hurts to, to go to the bathroom to defecate. Um, I've never seen a coccyx problem refer pain. Uh, into. It might refer pain in the gluteus maximus region. I've never seen the coccyx refer pain down the leg at all. Unlike a lot of other structures, like the facet joints can cause leg pain, the sacroiliac joints can cause leg pain, the disc tear can cause leg pain, uh, but the, and it's pretty rare. To, you're not going to run into too many coccyxes. Right, uh, let's see. So, yeah, this isn't too exciting, this ventral sacrococcygeal ligament, uh, but it's a continuation of the anterior longitudinal ligament, and it usually stops at about C1 or CX1 or C2. Uh, the lateral, we've talked about that, the lateral sacrococcygeal ligament, um, that is similar to another set of ligaments that run between the transverse processes of the lumbar thoracic and cervical spine and those are called intertransverse ligaments uh, and so down uh, down low we have uh, these lateral sac uh, sacrococcygeal ligaments and their claim to fame is that they create the S5 sacral S5 sacral foramen kind of talked about them there's another picture of them and there I think this exact same picture was on your lab test last time so should have a star by it and that's the deal there and you can see there is a uh, there's an anterior ramus the s5 anterior ramus making use of this makeshift hole here so it acts like a anterior and a posterior ramus though because there's not two of these 
Then we have the superficial and the deep dorsal sacrococcygeal ligaments. And we don't have a good example of these things. Uh, the deep dorsal is a continuation of the posterior longitudinal ligament. And I can show you when we get in lab uh, where that would be. Um, but it's on the, in the sacral canal, it's on the anterior portion of the sacral canal. Uh, and it just connects the coccyx with the sacrum. Basically goes down again to about CX, C, CX1 or CX2 level. And there, I try to Photoshop it in. Um, but I guess I could have made these sacral corneal kind of cover it. But this is plastered down. Just picture it being plastered down uh, on the sacrum here. And there's a tunnel right here. I'll show you in lab where you can stick a probe right up here. It's on the bottom there. But that's called the deep dorsal, sac uh, deep dorsal sacral coccygeal ligament. And it, what is it? It's a continuation of the posterior longitudinal ligament. And then there's a superficial one, a superficial dorsal sacrococcygeal ligament, which is a continuation of ligamentum flavum, which is super clinically important. You're going to have tons of patients with ligamentum flavum thickening. It's almost like the prostate. You know, old men, when they get over 50 or so, a whole bunch of them have problems with their prostate clamping down on the prosthetic urethra, and they can't pee very good anymore. Um, but the same uh, same kind of deal with ligamentum flavum thickening. We don't know we don't know why that happens, but it sure does happen. I see it. Uh, my my kind of my side business is I consult. I'm a because I work for spine surgeon for quite a while, uh, and I'm published in spine and things like that. I'm really into that surgery stuff. Um, I see this every week. I see ligamentum flavum causing stenosis. It's so so common. And we'll talk a lot about that when the time comes. But here's the best I could find of the superficial dorsal sacrococcygeal ligaments uh, kind of coming above and then really coming from inside. This drawing isn't really correct either. It comes from inside more than above like this. And then this, these fibers would be the deep dorsal sacrococcygeal ligaments, which are plastered kind of down into the plane of the page. All right, so that's enough for you.